This is a production of Cornell University. Um, my goal today is to, to share a few things with you to get you thinking about your teaching. Um, and I know that some of you are faculty and are currently in teaching roles, and some of you are graduate students and probably will be in teaching roles at some point. So I hope to, to get you thinking about some things. Um, I'm probably not going to go as deep as some of you might like to think, but I can certainly recommend some resources if you want to look at some of these topics at a little bit deeper level. Um, I do plan to have some interactivity built in, and so hopefully you came prepared with the mindset of at least being open to some discussion and some questioning, and so we'll see where that leads. So first I want to pose a question to you, and we're going to do a think-pair-share, and I think that uh, if I understand from Travis that you guys learned about some of these active learning strategies a, a little while ago, um, but we'll pose the question to you, I'll let you think about it for a second, then you can pair up with someone around you, and then uh, we'll, we'll have a few of you share some of those. So the question is, in your classes, what does it look like when students are getting it? And so think about that for a second. Okay, so let's go ahead and pair up and, and share what you think with someone around you. Okay, let's, let's rejoin, let's come back together. And so what were, what were some of the things that you guys were discussing? What does it look like when students are getting it? If you, can I have a few volunteers to, to share? Okay, so the students are volunteering, they're asking their own questions, they're, you can tell it because they're, they're really engaged. Okay, what else? Basically, even slapping. <laughs> oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Just body language, also communicating that they're getting it, um, maybe like leaning forward and eye contact. Yeah, so you're kind of reading their, their body language and, and their, the psychological signs that they're, they're giving. Good. And so I, I won't ask this question, but you can probably, as you were thinking about that, we're also thinking what's it look like when they're not getting it. Well, hopefully today I'm going to give you some things to think about so that we can really generate this more in your classes as opposed to the frustrating times when students aren't getting it. So um, I'm going to frame my, my discussion this morning around five principles. And there are a few handouts out and around, and, and so you can feel free to jot down a few extra things if you want. Um, but five principles that I think will help you create meaningful learning experiences uh, in your classes. So my objectives for today are we're going to describe the principles of experiential learning, and then ultimately uh, I'm going to encourage you guys at the end to think about your own teaching, whether it's your teaching now or whether you will have a teaching role in the future, about what are some things that you can do in your own teaching to, to make it more meaningful for your students. So principle one, learning begins with the existing knowledge and experiences of the learner. Learning begins with the existing knowledges and experiences of the learner. And so I'll let you read this a little bit. So is, is this what we think about our, our students? They're just a brain on a stick and nothing else matters? No, not really. I mean, really, it's, it's this stuff. This is what makes us uniquely human, are those individual experiences and aspirations and goals. And, and so I would contend that one of the things we ought to be doing as, as instructors is getting to know this student. I mean, we still want to care about this one, at least this part of this one, but getting to, getting to know this student so we know who are our students, where do they want to go, where, what do they want to be, what, are, what do they already know, what are the experiences they have. Second thing I want to bring up is there is no such thing as a blank slate. There's no such thing as a blank slate. So whether, no matter what you're teaching, your students are coming to you with some level of understanding or perhaps misunderstanding of the concepts that you're trying to teach. There is no blank slate. And so if we go into the learning environment thinking that there's a blank slate, we're starting at a disadvantage. It's really about trying to figure out what is on their slate and building off of that as opposed to starting from scratch. So principle number one, learning begins with the existing knowledge and experiences of the learner. And so let me pose a question to you. So based on principle number one, what are some things you might think about trying to do in your classes 
to, to capture principle number one. Do some kind of assessment at the beginning of class to see what students know already? Okay. Excellent idea. So do some sort of an assessment, whether it's formal or informal, to kind of gather what the students know. Okay. One more idea that you might do in, in your classes. Have them try to relate the material to what they know. Yeah, so have them try to connect with the new stuff you're giving. Have them try to connect with what they already know, and that will help you do that. I do an activity with some of my classes called a concept map. Any of you guys familiar with the concept map? It's kind of a, a, a way to organize thoughts. and so. Um, Actually, the graduate course I teach on experiential learning, I do this very activity at the very beginning of the semester. I have them create their concept map about how people learn. And then at the end of the semester, I have them recreate that concept map. And then I give them back the first one that they did so that they can see the growth in their own understanding of how people learn. So it's all, all about what they know and what they bring to the environment. Okay? So there are no blank slates. That was principle number one. Principle number two, learning is a cyclical process. It's a cyclical process. And I'm going to walk you through a, a series of little videos to kind of help us think about maybe a learning cycle that we might share in common that we have been through. And so I'll pose this question to you. How did you learn to ride a bike? And so I want you to think about that for a sec and kind of recreate some memories or pull some memories out of, of the file storage to think about what it was like when you learned to ride a bike and then I've got a, a series of short video clips that I think might demonstrate what some of us have experienced. Okay, so I would propose that step one for many of us, well let me ask before I give you what I think, let me ask you guys what you think. So what was, where did, what was step one for you guys in learning how to ride a bike? No recollection. No recollection. <laughs> could you, could you? Creating the wheel in yeah. some people's cases. Well, that, that would be a precursor um, because the wheel is, is a critical component of a bicycle. Other thoughts, yeah. Getting a beautiful purple bike that I wanted to learn how to ride. So getting that first bike that you really wanted to ride. Other memories. So seeing other people ride bikes, okay? Any other ideas? Yeah. My dad holding the back of the seat. That, yeah. <laughs> yep, I think many of us have similar memories to that. And so, all great, and, and you're going to see the, most of those things, maybe with the exception of creating the wheel, in these video clips that I'm going to show you. And so let me start with this one, and I think we've got this where it's going to work out, right? I know, it's hard. Yeah, it was helping. Okay, and so I would propose that that might have been step one, and that might have been when we got that first tricycle, okay? And we probably did see someone ride the bike before we got to this stage, so maybe this is step two really other than step one, but what are some things that we probably had to learn about riding a bike when we were at this stage? Coordination. Coordination, okay. Travis? How muscle tone. Yeah, I mean the pedal, it's, it's a little bit different motion. It's not walking, it's a little bit different motion. Okay, what else might we have learned at this stage? Yeah, a little bit of balance. I mean the tricycle has a little bit more balance than a two-wheel bike, but still you can't lean way over or way back because you'll fall off. Okay, what about stopping on the tricycle? How do you stop on a tricycle? Either, yeah, you pedal reverse or just stop pedaling or you put your feet down, okay? So that, I would propose that might be step one. And so now I'll bring you to step two. Maybe. Okay, wait, guys. Okay, show me how you pedal. Okay, and so step two is when we got that that new bike, that there was a two-wheel bike, but it had training wheels on it. And so what are some things that we probably had to learn when we were at step two? 
Yes, yeah, steering's a little bit different on, on that. You know, on, on the tricycle, the pedals are on the front wheel, whereas the pedals are back further on those bikes. What else do we have to learn at, at step two? The brakes, right. And what kind of brakes do the, those kind of bikes have? Yeah, right, you push back on the pedal and when you get good, you can leave the skid marks on the driveway. <laughs> okay, what else do we have to learn at that stage? Yeah, it's bigger, it's up a little bit higher, how to get on, okay. What else? Maybe one more thing? This side of the room, this side of the room hasn't been as... as. Where, where you can ride, you might be able to go. Yeah, so you might get a little bit more freedom, particularly as you get a little bit older, <coughs> mom or dad or whoever lets you get a little bit more freedom, okay. So our, our, our travel through the Bicycle Riding Academy is continuing. Oop, this is not... Keep going, keep going, keep going, pedal hard! I'll restart. Okay, and so step three was the day that the training wheels came off. And of course, when I ask that question, that's usually where the people go, is that you know, mom or dad holding on to the back. So what, what, what did we have to learn the day that the training wheels came off? Balance, right. And, and balance is really critical when you don't have the training wheels. Okay, what else do we have to learn at that stage? You have to maintain you do. You have to maintain a certain speed because even if you've got, well, there's a few people that can balance standing still, but I'm not one of them. But yeah, you got to maintain some level of speed or you fall over. What else do we have to learn at that one? Yeah. Uh, tipping over doesn't mean you're not cut off the bike, right? Yeah, because most of us were there, right? Most of us tipped over a time or two. And of course, we had some trust issues with mom or dad hanging onto the back because, <laughs> you know, they, and you know, those of you with children probably went through this with your own children is, you know, they make you promise to not let go. Of course, what do we do? We let go every time. <laughs> and then I promise I won't let go this time. And we let go again. And so, so it's kind of we're, we're working through that cycle and we're getting better and better. So now I say we move on to step four. <laughs> so. So step four, step four, we, we, we are a little bit braver and those boundaries are a little bit further out. So what do, you, what do we have to lose, lose? What do we have to learn at, at step four? Wear a helmet. Safety, yeah, wear a helmet, safety. What else? We're probably getting faster. What's that? Look out for others. Yeah, look out for our surroundings. We're probably getting faster. We're probably getting a little bit older. So mom or dad probably gave us a little bit more room to stretch out, you let us take a few more risks. Of course, sometimes with the risk comes those sorts of things. And so, you know, we after we run into our friend and we get up and we get a bandaid on our elbow or whatever else, and then we get back on the bike and we learn to, well, next time maybe we need to look out where we're going. Okay, so now let's see what's on step five. Ah, uh, what happens at step five? <laughs> now that one, that one was staged because I have not found a great video for this yet. But step five was when we got that first bigger bike, right? And, and what did the what do the bigger bikes have that the smaller bikes don't have? Yeah, everyone's at handlebar brakes, right? And what did we learn is a critical piece of information <laughs> related to handlebar brakes. Apply both at the same time, or if you're only going to apply one, which one do you apply? The rear. Because what happens if you apply only the front? Yeah, and how did we learn that? Either intentionally or unintentionally, we did something like that, right? We flipped off and we said, ah, oh, okay, I better not do that again. Let me just work on the back brakes. The cool thing about that one, though, is the learning to fall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one, that, you, could, you could tell that kid had practiced a little bit. He, is, he, was, he was there. Now, I would contend that our, our journey through bike riding is still growing. Okay, a lot of wind noise on that one. So that was, that was just a person riding a bike on a leisurely thing. Now how many of you would say that even if you haven't been on a bike in a couple of years, you could probably handle that today, at least on level ground, maybe not on some of the hills you guys have around here, but on level ground. So most of us would say we can, 
we can do that with reasonable thing. We've, we've reached that level. Um, although, I don't know about this campus, our campus, the bicyclists are crazy. You about have to chase them around to, you know, I had a professor when I was an undergrad, he used to carry a golf club, and he was infamous for carrying this golf club around campus. And anytime somebody got close to me, he started swinging this golf club because he, <laughs> he wanted the bikes to stay away from him because they will zoom up right behind him. But so most of us, most of us probably have skill levels similar to that. We could, with a moderate amount of success, get on a bike and, and travel across campus. Now, would, is that the pinnacle of bike riding skill? I see some heads shaking No. So what might be a next level of bike riding skill? What are some examples? Riding up the hill. Oh, riding up the hill, yeah. That's, Oh yeah, clip-in pedals. I, I, I'm too scared to do that. Have you guys seen those where your feet actually like attach to the pedal and there's like a yeah. trick to get your foot out? Uh, that's not for me. What other kinds of bike riding might be the next level? My little brother gets a little yeah, the jumps and the ramps and, and then you know the, the guys that do the racing and such. Anybody here do like BMX racing or the, the mountain biking or the, the, like the Tour de France sorts of stuff racing? <laughs> So, but yeah, so there is a level. And so um, this next one, I found this video by a kid named Spencer. And so I want you to look at some of the stuff that Spencer can do and think about how he got to that point. And so, any, we have any Spencers in here? No, I, you know, I, I think as a kid, I probably in, accidentally did some of those moves, you know, flipping off or doing some stuff. I'm, I always look back at my, I've got two brothers, and it, it's amazing that none of us have brain damage considering the stuff that we did as kids. So, but how do you think Spencer got to the point where he's at? Do you think it just happened overnight? No, he had a lot of practice. Do you think every one of his flips, he worked perfect the first time? No, he probably had a lot of bumps, a lot of bruises, and he, you know, he'd try to do a flip and he'd land on his head or his butt or his back or whatever, and he'd figure out, okay, what do I need to do different? He kept practicing. So he was working through and, and trying to learn each time he tried something. So now I propose that one more step in our bicycle academy. I know, it's hard. Yeah, we're helping. What do you say? So obviously that's where we started. So why are we back at that point now? Why why are we back at that stage? Are we is it kind of we're gonna be old and have to get back on a tricycle one day? Yeah, how how to teach someone. So now when we're back at that stage, we're not the little guy with the helmet on the on the tricycle, we're the parent behind the tricycle um, trying to teach our child to do that. And so what what I've tried to demonstrate with those videos and, and getting you guys to think back to your own experiences. Say I was trying to connect to your experiences with riding a bike to think about how you went through that process. And it was, you know, if we went all the way to where Spencer is, I mean, that might be a 10 or 12 year development cycle in terms of, of bike riding. And so learning is a process that we go through that we might call the learning cycle. And I wish I could have a good way to demonstrate this three dimensionally. The best way I can describe it is a slinky. You guys know what a slinky looks like? And so think of this as, as a slinky with, with multiple revolutions. And so, we, you know, somewhere in, in our being, we've had a, a very initial focus with the concept, and we'll stick with our bicycle example here. So then we, we have an experience with that bicycle. You know, we got that, that first tricycle, and we had to learn about balance. And so, you know, we leaned too far and we fell off. Well, down here in the reflection phase, we think about, well, what can I do differently? What does that mean? Why does this hurt? And we think, okay, well, next time, maybe I shouldn't lean quite so far, and we try it again. And we keep going through this cycle over and over and over, and, and we get that bike with handlebar brakes, and we hit the front brake, and we flip off, and as we're laying on the ground, we reflect and say, dang, that hurts. What don't I want to do again? Okay, I won't hit the front brake, and let me try that again. And so it's just a constant, ongoing process. And so 
thinking now to your own current uh, and future uh, practices in, in your own teaching, what can you take away from about the learning cycle relative to how you create learning experiences for your students? What are some things you can take away that, to help you with that? Okay, so it's not always going to go successful, and, and we can learn from the unsuccessful attempts at things. Okay, good. What else? Yeah. Breaking it down into steps. Yeah, break it down into steps. We can. Yeah, that's an excellent thing. And sometimes we forget that we all have advanced degrees in our respective areas. Many times the students that we're working with, especially the undergrads and even some of the grad students, they don't have near the, the frame of reference that we do. Okay. What else? Travis? Yeah, I mean, a note of remembering the, the pieces of the puzzle that we have forgotten, you know, the, the little mistakes we made in learning about concepts or procedures that now as experts, we just kind of forget that we knew that. Mm -hmm. We don't slow down and teach that to our, our yep. students. They won't learn. Those. Yep, that's a good point. And, and I would contend, and this comes from my own personal experiences and as well as in the work that I do at the University of Florida, I get the opportunity to do a lot of peer observation of other faculty all over the college. And so one of my observations is that as faculty and as instructors, we can get to be pretty good at providing a lot of creative experiences for our students. I mean, we can come up with lots of cool experiences for them. And we invest a lot of effort up here, but we probably don't place near enough emphasis down here. So we might create a very cool, uh, experience in the greenhouse where the students are, are, are growing out a crop of, of whatever. And, and we'll talk to them about that, but then we don't help them reflect and generalize based on that experience. We just jump right to the next experience. And so some of your students are probably fairly self-reflective and are themselves hitting these steps, but I would contend that some of your students probably, they're just sticking up here. They're not really learning from it and they're jumping to the next experience. And so. You know, I would suggest that one thing you can do is, is intentionally design activities to help your students reflect about what you're doing, figure out what the next step is, and work through the learning cycle, okay? So principle two, learning is a cyclical process. Principle number three, learning is about transforming experiences. And so we talked a minute about creating those experiences. Learning actually happens about with the transformation of those experiences. And so what I mean by this is, as, as educators, one of our goals, or our goal, is to help take things that exist out here in the wide, wide world and help put them here in the brains of our students. Now, on my campus tour today, I got to go into the, psycho the psychology department and actually saw a bunch of human brains in jars, which was kind of interesting. Um, but it's about, it's about transforming those experiences. And, it's not as simple as checking into a hospital and having a surgical procedure where they you know, stitch you open and dump it in and stitch it closed. If they could do that, we'd be out of a job because they wouldn't need us to help our students learn. But it's about transforming those experiences for our students. Now, and this is, might sound like a very simple question, but I think it's an important one as we think about what we do as educators and what we think about as far as the, the types of experiences that we create. But, what mechanisms does the human brain use to get information? How, how does our brain get information? Our, our senses, right. Our, our eyes and nose and ears and, and mouth and such. So, so we, our brain receives information through sensory inputs from our five senses. And so as we are thinking about creating experiences for our students to transform, we're really thinking about creating opportunities for our students to use their senses to grasp the, the information, the concepts that we want them to do. Now, I, I'm not gonna pass judgment on Cornell, but I'll point right at the University of Florida. I travel around and look in many of our college classrooms, and which two senses do you think that we probably overuse in the way that we teach them, at least on our campus? Eyes and ears, eyes and ears. And sometimes it's not even the eye. Sometimes it's a lecture with no illustration, but it's eyes and ears. And so we, we really rely on the eyes and the ears. And you know that 
for some concepts, that's not a bad way to go about it, but I would contend that there are probably plenty of opportunities where we might think about taste and smell and touch and what can we do to provide a more sensory rich experience um, for our students. I mean, some of the stuff that you guys do with the fruits and the vegetables and stuff, I mean, shoot, let them taste it, let them touch it, let them do whatever they smell it, whatever they need to do to really get that. And it's about, as the information is traveling into our brain, the more ways and the more modalities that we can get it in there, the deeper it's going to be embedded and the, the learning is going to be even stronger. So schematically, what might that look like? This is a, a model of, of cognition called the information processing model. And this was, uh, has some parallels to the way a computer works. It actually, in, in educational psychology, during the time when they were developing this model, it was in the early ages of the, the computer age, and so they drew some parallels from it. But it, it, to me, it makes pretty decent sense about um, how that works. And so we have some sort of an input through our senses, through our senses, transformed into working memory or short-term memory, and then stored into long-term memory, and then when we need to use it, it's pulled back into, into working memory, okay? So that intuitively makes sense probably to, to most of you, but it, I wanna put a couple other layers on that relative to the things we've been talking about. And so if we think about this in terms of where these things are happening, I would contend that these things are happening outside of the person, so we're providing these experiences. So I, on a daily basis in your classes, when you create learning activities for your students, you're, you're creating these sensory input opportunities for the students, okay? This half is what's happening inside up here. This is the part we can see pretty easily. This is the part that we hope that's happening. And when students are getting it, we think we see evidence that this is happening, but, but not always. Then to put it one more layer on it, we think about our learning cycle model that we just saw, this is providing the experience, this is providing the reflection and generalization. And so I would contend that if we only focus on this part, this part may or may not be happening as well as we would like. And so I think it's important to, to really complete that cycle to where we're providing opportunities for the students to, to really internalize that at a cognitive level. So our principle number three was that learning is about transforming experiences. And so thinking about the few things that we just talked about, what are some things that you might think about, well, I can do this different in my classes that might make a difference? A few ideas. I'm going to ask a question. Mm -hmm. what are the reflection and generalization, I, I don't like us. We, I have a lot of experiences, but to get students to stop and reflect and generalize, what have you seen to work effectively? Is that the question you're asking us? What's worked effectively? Well, I, yeah, so what's worked effectively for you? That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I know well, you I know you well enough to know that you. Journaling is used quite a lot, and students yeah. you say, oh, okay, we're going to do a little bit of a, a journaling class. Students are like, ah, I do that all the time in all my other classes. Yeah, it might be journaling, it might just be some discussion, it might just be some thought provoking questions. Uh -huh. She uses the think pair share exercise. And then I taught a class in Marvin as part of Maddie's you know, students uh -huh. that we were asked to teach a, cl a, uh -huh. a class. And I used think pair share, and I, it helped to communicate the topic that we were discussing and trying to teach the class. So I think it was good because it was a short like, sound bite, and the students took the information in and then projected it back out and got okay. an opportunity. Yeah, good. You had a, a different one? Oh, I was going to say, um, have them teach it. Have them teach it, yeah. So in anything to really just pause for a few minutes and, and have the students do something that forces them to think about it, whether it's a think, pair, share, there's a little activity called a, a minute paper where they just exactly 30, 60 seconds, they write down what they just learned. Or uh, you know anything to get them to discuss with, with a, a, a colleague, journaling, um, anything just to pause. And so, you know, if, if you are accustomed to lecturing for 50 minutes straight, if, if you want to make an immediate change, one thing might be lecture for 10 minutes, then do a quick little activity to get them, allow them to think. Lecture for another 10 minutes, then give them a little activity to think about what you've done, just to, to break it up a little bit. Um, and so one of the things that we really want to do and suggest is that implement variety 
in what you do. And so, you know, you might like think pair share and it might make sense to you, but that doesn't mean it's going to make sense to all your students. And so you want to have, implement some variety in what you do so that your students can, you can reach a greater number of students. Yeah. Um, I had an internship over the summer, and like what we did, it was like more educational. Mm -hmm. um, you had an end of the day note, so you pretty much recapped everything that you learned during the day. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, you work with like, say, your supervisor and you talk about like what you learned, and that was like a great way to tie everything together. Yep. You get so caught up in everything, and it's just really good to go back and like see what you actually learned. Yeah, uh, yeah that's so a good thing. Generalizing, you're reflecting, so that's kind of a good. Yep, yep, that's, that's an excellent idea. Yeah, so there, there's no magic bullet. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, whatever, figure out what's going to work for you and your situation, and your students, and, and occasionally pause and let your students actually think about what it is that you're doing. Okay, so we'll move on. Principle four learning is about building connections. Learning is about building connections. And so I want to introduce a, a term to you called brain plasticity. Um, and it, it's the, the cool thing about learning is that learning actually causes a physical change in the human brain. And so if we think about what we do as educators, we, we think about imparting knowledge to our students, helping them learn things. We are actually, hopefully, causing some physical changes in the human brain. And so that was a pretty, when I first learned that, it was a pretty powerful thing to me as an educator to think about you know, the, the efforts that I'm making even though I may not be able to see them, is causing a physical change in, uh, in the human brain. Now, if we were wanted to be at a scientific level and you want to inject a bunch of dye in somebody's brain and put it under a very powerful microscope, you could see it. It's about uh, building and breaking brain synapses, and those are the natural electrical connections in the human brain. And so if you're interested in this sort of stuff, you can go Google it and look it up in the, in the biomedical literature. But it really causes a physical change in the human brain. Now, some of you might be comfortable at the microscopic level. I'm certainly not comfortable at the microscopic level, so I like to think at, at more the theoretical and what can, I, what can I see and what can I do. And so there's a, a concept called cognitive schema that to me makes a lot of sense in how to think about how people learn. If we think about cognitive schema, it, it's, I visualize it as kind of a web of knowledge with each one of these nodules being a discrete piece of information. And so if we go back to our bicycle riding example, um, this one might be pedaling, and this one might be balance, and this one might be turning, and this one might be handlebar brakes, and so forth. And so we've got this existing web of knowledge. Now, let me pose a question to you. Thinking about a novice versus an expert, how do you think these schema might differ? Yeah, so the expert is going to have more connections between here, and the expert will probably also have more nodules, and so it'll be much more connected. And so you all, in your respective areas, in probably have a very well-developed cognitive schema around whatever it is that, that you do. Um, I would contend that your students, when they come to you, probably have a very skeletal one with either some missing connections or maybe some connections that are actually wrong and need to be broken. Um, and so the, the challenge is then, so as an educator, we present that new piece of knowledge, and we are very good at this. We can create a lecture, we can create an experiment, we can create a reading, we can do this very well. We can give lots of new knowledge. But what's, what's the problem with what we see right here? It's not connected, right, it's not connected. And so this is where you guys get very frustrated, and I've been there myself, where you say, dang it, I taught them that. How come they can't figure this out? Well, it's because they have this piece of knowledge. They just never made the connections that it fits out here. And so it's just laying out there by itself. And so if you ask them to give you back that information in the exact same way that you gave them that information, they can probably do that. But if you ask them to use that information in a different way, they're like, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's not connected. And so it's all about building these connections. And that comes back to the notion of building those, the, the opportunities for reflection and generalization to help your students figure out how does this new piece of knowledge connect with, with the existing knowledge. Now, the challenging thing is you get that brand new class at the beginning of the semester and you've got 30 students in it or whatever, and so they're in your class and each one of your students has an existing cognitive schema. How many of those 30 students are going to have the same cognitive schema? 
Zero. Zero. Now, they might have some shared experiences. If you teach a senior level course in the major and your students have taken pretty similar courses to get to that point, there's probably some similarities in their schema, but they're never going to be the same. The, the challenging part, and also sometimes the exciting part, is teaching those introductory classes when you don't have a clue what they know, um, but they bring in a lot of interesting experiences in there. So again, it's all about building connections. And so that's principle four. And I'm getting close on time, aren't I, Neil? You're doing great. Am I? Okay. Uh -huh. Got 15 minutes left. <clears throat> okay, I want to save a little bit of time for questions. So as we help the students process, so we give them that new, that new piece of information, we introduce that new concept, there, there's really two general ways that we can think about that new piece of knowledge. Either the, they're going to assimilate it, so if that new concept, that new experience fits with their existing schema, they're going to kind of say, okay, that makes sense, it fits. Or they might have to accommodate that new experience if it's different or if it's inconsistent or contradicts what they already know. And so they can probably process these sorts of things a little bit quicker than they can these sorts of things. And so it's all about providing opportunities to, to help your students figure out how does this new piece of information fit. And that's where that reflection and that generalization can help kind of to tie that loop back around. So that's principle four. It's all about building connections. And so in your own teaching, what are some things that you might be able to do to help your students build those connections? Okay, yeah, so give them different opportunities to, to kind of experience that and help build those connections. Good. What else? Yeah, he can. And it, it's very nice if you can organize your, your course or whatever around a broader conceptual framework and keep tying back to that framework to help the students see where it fits. Because it might be crystal clear to you that A plus B plus C equals D to students, it, it may not be. And so having that larger graphic organizer will help do that. Good. I, I want to take a quick, in my, when I teach my classes, I say we'll take a quick time out. Earlier, that was demonstrating wait time. So when you ask a question, and you just wait until it's awkwardly silent, and then someone's willing to give you an answer. And so when you ask a question, don't feel afraid to have the awkward silence, because sooner or later, someone will, will give you a good answer. So other ideas about providing that, helping students make those connections? Teaching chemistry, if I'm teaching the shot with these principles, uh -huh. a system in stress readjusts to minimize the stress. I ask them in their personal lives, where have they been in stress? And what did they do? They readjust. So I, I tie it back to personal experience. Ah, that's that's an excellent way. And so connecting it with connecting a, a new concept to a different kind of experience that has some similarities to it. Good, good. Okay, so principle five. Teaching is about creating meaningful learning experiences. Teaching is about creating meaningful learning experience. And we talked about the learning cycle, and we talked about that we are, are very good at creating learning experiences. And so I want to throw a couple ideas out at you about creating meaningful learning experiences, things that are really going to engage your students and, and drive things home. The first thing I want to do is, is talk to you about just a couple of differences between teaching and facilitation, and sometimes we like to throw those words around a little bit, but I would argue that most of the time the meaningful learning experiences are happening when we are facilitating the learning process as opposed to teaching. And so in teaching, the, teaching, the teacher delivers the knowledge. In facilitation, the learner constructs the knowledge. Okay, so a subtle difference. Teaching instruction is rigidly planned. Facilitation, it's more flexible and spontaneous, and we're open to those anomalies that happen that we weren't expecting. In teaching, the teacher has very strict control over the environment. In facilitation, the teacher and the learner share the control of the environment. In teaching, the learners are passive. In facilitation, the learners are active. And so I would encourage you to think about your own teaching right now and figure out, okay, where do I, where do I fit 
on this continuum? And, and are there some things that you can change to maybe inch over this way? Now, it's a little bit intimidating sometimes to, to go into a class session and have a rough idea about what you think is going to happen in that class session. But based on the interactions with the students, it might go a slightly different direction than you were, you were planning. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's tough sometimes as the instructor to give up a little bit of that of control to say, okay, we're, gonna, we're in this together and I'm going to help facilitate this process, but you're not getting off easy. You've got to contribute as well. So I'd encourage you to think about that. The other idea I want to present to you is called Dale's Cone of Experience. How many of you have heard of Dale's Cone? Okay, so a couple. And so Dale's Cone, and, and this really, it's actually pretty dated, but it's a, pretty, it's a seminal work from, from Edgar Dale, and it comes out of the educational media literature, but it's really about as we think about creating those experiences for our students, we have choices to make in how we choose to present that. Everything from up here, which is all symbolized, which is very abstract, to things that are down here, which are very concrete and very direct. And, and so an example might be if, if we were going to teach, uh, how many of you teach some sort of plant identification? Okay, so I figured in this department there'd be a handful of you guys that teach those sort of courses. And so as we're teaching those sorts of courses, we can make some choices about how do we, how do we, how do we want to teach that. Well, we might be up here and talk about what plants look like, or we might be up here and show drawings about what plants look like. We might show pictures of plants. We might come down here, but when possible and practical, let them see the real thing. And so I would encourage you to think about as you are teaching concepts in your classes, when it's possible and when it's practical to think about what can I do to provide direct personal interaction of the, with the students with the concepts. Now, logistically, and sometimes it's just impractical to do those sorts of things, but I would contend, you know, if, if, if you can let them see the real thing and do the real thing and touch the real thing, then give them the real thing. Let's not come up here. Um, so I would encourage you to think down there where we are really in the doing phase as opposed to the observing or the symbolizing. Next thing I want you to think about is what I call, let's add some real world experiences to, to what we do. And so I would propose that in a class you might add some things like guest speakers. And I know you guys have, have world class faculty here. But let's hypo hypo uh, hypothesize for a minute that maybe there is an expert that knows something better than someone here does. Why not invite that person in or Skype that person? And that's the beautiful thing now with technology is, is you can bring anybody, you can bring anybody into, into the classroom pretty easy. Field trips. Again, it's about going to see the real thing. Um, get your students involved in, in research. Uh, do service learning projects, do outdoor adventure learning sorts of things where you're getting the students some direct purposeful experience with those things. Now, activities outside of a course that are more at the program level might be things like internships, study abroad experiences, or broader research projects. And, and um, I don't know about on this campus, but uh, I suspect you guys are similar to us, that we've got a lot of bright, energetic students that are, are begging for opportunities. and, and on our campus, we probably don't make good enough use of all these energetic, bright young people in the other work that we do, in, in the research and extension activities that we do. I would contend that there are probably some great opportunities um, to get those students uh, actively engaged in a variety of things. So principle five was creating those meaningful learning experiences. So now we're going to talk about, let's take this home. What can you do? And so we're going to go back to another think pair share and so I want to ask you guys two very specific very concrete things that you could take away from my discussion today to immediately at least in cases that the faculty immediately for the grad students at some point in the future two things that you can immediately take away to make an impact on your teaching so think about that for a sec and then pair up with with someone around you and share your ideas <laughs> Let's reconvene, we'll get a few ideas shared, and then we'll save a few minutes for questions. And so let's, let's hear a few examples, and, and Geneva, I'll give you guys a heads up. I'm going to call on you guys in just a minute, so you guys can be thinking too. But what are a few examples of things that, uh, that you could immediately implement in your teaching for the faculty or for the grad students, something that you could uh, to do in the future? So a few examples. Not lecture as much. 
Okay, not lecture as much. Okay, yeah, help, help your students draw the connections out of a guest speaker so it's not just this anomaly where this strange person was here for a day and now they're gone to have to pull some meaning out of that. Good. Another example. Yeah. After a field trip, the experiential learning part uh, encourages students to relax. Yes, yeah. So after we've had that experience, to help the students kind of draw some. So it wasn't just a cool day outside the classroom. It was actually there was some meaning out of it and helped the students pull that out. So Geneva, what about you guys? What's something that uh, some of you guys might choose to implement? I have a suggestion. Um, we, teaching a, a co-taught course with you know three sections and different instructors but sort of uh, struggle with the integration. So I think maybe at the beginning use that, that schema as a way to show interactions within the components where we uh, have different people talking about it, it doesn't always integrate as well as one person might. Okay, great idea. How about one more example from Geneva? This is just like my class. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I use a professional audience instead of a student audience. Okay. Passing around something physical for them to play with with their hands. Yeah. Demonstrate to the principal. Yeah, that, that's an excellent, you know, you, you know, you guys are going to have a lot of kinesthetic learners and just having them, of course, the danger is sometimes that can be a distraction where they might be playing with it and not listen to you, but at least they're, they're getting some of that. Any other examples in here or, or maybe we can shift over to questions? Yeah. Um, take, take your students outside on campus, public school, there's a wealth of Yeah, I mean, the, the, the world is our campus and then particularly now with technologies, we can, you know, we can travel around the world in a very easy way where in, in the past uh, it hadn't been quite so easy. So I think we've got a few minutes for questions, and so I'll take a few questions. So in terms of the generalization and reflection, uh -huh. oftentimes it's a lot more convenient to give students you know, a set of questions to take home and read and write and respond. And yeah. how, obviously that's probably better than nothing, but how much better than nothing is it? it well, it is, assuming that the students actually do it, it is better than nothing. But there, there's a concept now, and, and I'm actually playing around with it in one of my undergrad classes, it's called the flipped classroom. Have you guys heard of that terminology before? It's the whole notion of, of let's take the basic knowledge level stuff and do that as homework in the form of online lectures and readings and let's use class time then for the deeper discussions and the reflections on that. And so you might think about, you know, are there some ways that I can do some things? Are there some things that I can take out of the face-to-face -face time to provide more opportunities for the face-to-face -face time? Because, I mean, let's face it, I mean, how many of you carry around something that looks like this? Most of you probably do. And, and I hate to break it to you, but everything that every one of us knows is available on this little device. And so the, the, the benefit our students get from us is not the knowledge. They can get the knowledge anywhere. They get the benefit of interacting with us so that we can think like a plant breeder or think like a weed scientist or think like an educator or think like a whatever you are. Think like So the students can learn and interact with us so that they can learn to think like whatever it is we want them to think like. Good. Yeah. With the young mom saying, very good, very good, very good. And I think it's Carol Dweck who um, had some groundbreaking research that looked at the impact of all of this positive uh, judgment, essentially, all of this praise, you're so smart, you're so beautiful, you're so great, is creating a generation of risk-averse learners yeah, who are really afraid to make mistakes and I think you know we're seeing an impact of that in our classes what are some very concrete ways in which you have fostered um, a healthy risk taking in your teaching yeah and so the and that's a, a little bit of expertise but I can share some personal examples and it's it's about creating an environment where being unsuccessful is okay and it's about learning from those mistakes and, and I teach classes on teaching methods and so I teach all day about how to teach and then conversely at the end of the semester I ask my students to evaluate my teaching so it's a little bit intimidating to talk about the entire semester about this is how you teach good oh by the way evaluate my teaching but I, I will periodically throw myself out there and say okay I just did this activity let's critique it and so I, I model 
the behavior that I hope that they can see. And, and I also, in the way that I evaluate student work, um, I, I tend to be very proactive in providing constructive feedback, and, and I try not to be penalizing in the way that I provide that feedback to, you know, did you think about this? What could you do to make it better? And to provide some constructive feedback. And, and, and I also try to provide very quick feedback to my students because if, if we're teaching a course where the concepts build on each other and, and you've taught concept one and then tested it and then you're on concept before before you give feedback from concept one the students might have some misconceptions they don't even know that they have by the time that they get there um, so it, it, that's our students at, at Florida are like that I mean they've, they've gotten straight A's their entire life and so anything less than a straight A is failure to them even though they haven't earned a straight A yeah Thank you for the last one. When you talked about being a little more spontaneous and flexible, it sort of makes you a little bit more vulnerable, and that's okay. You're taking a risk with nature. I don't really know. That's not yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't make you less smart, obviously. So, if anything, yeah. you might get more respected in that situation. You can see that. Yeah, that's, yeah. And it's, it's the, the classroom becomes a very fun <laughs> and dynamic place although it can be a little bit intimidating at times too because you don't know what's coming next. Okay, we have yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, in terms of giving information uh, to students, in many cases you can say give a relationship between two, two factors in a uh, table of numbers or in a graph. Uh, at least personally I gain so much more and it sticks with me a lot better if it's a, a graph form, I can see the shape, I can see the spacing between effects or whatever. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, and, and actually, so, and, and that's and, and for a lot of people, that is the way that they like to receive information. Um, I, I would encourage you to think about, in a given class of any size, you're going to have differing kinds of students in that class and, and as instructors we tend to be most comfortable teaching the way that we like to have been taught when we were students but to recognize that all of your students aren't exactly the same and so it's about presenting things with some variety in the way that you do that so that you present those those graphs and those charts and and that's going to reach those kinds of a student and then you're going to you know deliver that that fabulous lecture that's very engaging and you're going to reach those kind of students and then you're going to do an activity that involves the students out in the greenhouse or whatever and you're going to engage those kind of students so it's really about providing that variety of different kinds of experiences um, for the students um, but I would uh, I, I would look for opportunities and tying it back to when we talked about the sensory inputs look for opportunities to engage all five senses when practical and, and when appropriate um, as opposed to, to just the visual and auditory that we often do. Other question? Other question yeah. So we're, we're being introduced to the MOOCs where you have 10,000 students, none of whom you can see. Um, and from what I understand it now, on the reflection and generalization part of the uh, learning process, is really done by small groups of students with each other. So that's about the end of my knowledge right there, but could you uh, touch on how this process that, works that's in that giant setting. Shipped into the online environment, it does create some different challenges and it also creates some opportunities. And, and um, reflection does not have to be just in small groups, it can be, but you've got, you're gonna have some learners that are very social in the way that they learn and, and they're, gonna, they're gonna want to share with their peers. But you're also gonna have some learners that are very introspective and, and like to think things through themselves. And so, just providing that pause time for them to be able to do that. And so in an online environment, it might be through uh, some sort of a discussion board where you know maybe you're not forcing them to respond to anybody else's thoughts, you're just giving them an opportunity to put their own thoughts down. Or maybe it's a, 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 a guided reflective, reflective journal where over the course of, of the class, they've gotta do an entry once a day, once a week, once a however that is structured. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, there's, as I said earlier, there's not a magic bullet that is going to fit everybody, which is, is challenging, um, but it also can be, can be fun because it gives us as the educators the opportunity to try out some different things and, and to experiment a little bit. And, and one of the things that, and I, I try to model this in, in my own professional life too, it's, it's about not being satisfied with the status quo. 
and it's about trying out new things. I mentioned earlier I'm trying out the flipped classroom, and this is the second semester now I've done that, and I, I went through the learning cycle myself the first semester and figured out some things that worked and some things that didn't work, and, and so now I'll do that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tenured, so it's a little bit easier for me to be a little bit more flexible and spontaneous. The untenured faculty probably have to be a little bit more focused and a little bit more uh, norm reference. Yeah. So are you saying the flip or the flip? flip. What does it mean? It means that you, so the, the has been that the face-to-face -face time is the the instructor lecturing and giving information and then the students then outside of class time take that information and apply it through some sort of a problem set homework project etc the flipped classroom does that 180 and so you create a way to deliver the lecture part outside of classroom perhaps through some online recorded lectures readings those sorts of things then you use the class time the face-to-face -face time for uh, problem activities, inquiry activities, uh, those sorts of things to where if we think about, are you guys familiar with Bloom's taxonomy and, and the levels of cognition? So delivering the lecture part, that's oftentimes at lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy. The problem sets are at the upper levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So we, when they're with us, under expert supervision, we're doing the low level stuff. We send them home by themselves to work on the upper level stuff. They reach a problem where they're struggling and they're stuck. And so the flipped classroom, you do that just 180 to where they're doing the higher level stuff with you to where you're helping them work through issues and challenges and things. Um, and so it's, again, it, it, uh, it has not been a perfect switch for me. I, I'm knocking on wood that this second iteration will go a little bit smoother than the first iteration. Um, but it's, and it's a different model for the students because the students aren't used to that. And so it takes a little bit of training on their part to get them prepared for that. Yeah, yeah, you have to get them focused on actual learning as opposed to just getting the grade, which that can be challenging on some of these students. So, are we, how are we doing? All right, we're, we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Geneva. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.